Including the nucleus. So basically, the cytoplasm is the cytosol, plus all the cytoplasmic organelles it contains. The cytosol is, is, is basically water with some salts, maybe some dissolved protein, sugars, and other molecules. We'll spend most of the time talking about the different organelles. So it's the cytosol plus. Organelles. The first one I'll talk about is the one that gives cells that do a lot of work all of their energy, mitochondria. There's kind of a simple illustration of a mitochondria, and it's trying to emphasize the chemistry that it does. Now, what it says on the slide, the cellular functions are dependent upon a continuous breakdown of organic molecules, mostly fat and carbs, fat and CHO. During the process of cellular respiration, glycolysis and the TCA cycle, which produces ATP. That, that's the main job of the mitochondria. ATP is a, is a molecule and a class of molecules which are known as these high energy phosphates. In the case of ATP, you have an adenosine, I think I might have mentioned this before, and you have the three phosphates. And again, you cleave that last one to release energy. You break the bond to release energy to do cell work. Work mean like, like like the pumping we talked about. Sodium, potassium, ATPase pump, that, that kind of work. And the chemistry that's involved, um, out, outside, outside the mitochondria, there's the process of glycolysis, where you metabolize glucose. So one process is outside mitochondria. The process of glycolysis. And I'll just mention the process. I, I won't go through the, the chemical stages. But that process produces um, ATP. And it produces ATP anaerobically. Produces ATP anaerobically. That means with, without oxygen. Okay. And how does it aerobic respiration? This this pro this process does not occur in the mitochondria. It occurs outside. Oh, okay. So the aerobic respiration that that's the next chemical process that does occur inside. 
these inner membranes of the mitochondria, the TCA cycle. Okay. So we'll show that this one here. <coughs> So I'm writing inside mitochondria. There's these membranes that fold on the inside, and they're called the cristae. I'll show you a better picture of it later. Cristae, A-E. Uh, the membranes are, that's where all the enzymes are to do the chemistry. contains enzymes. To help um, aerobic metabolism. Uh, those are the processes of TCA stands for the tricarboxylic acid cycle. Tri carboxylic acid cycle. And there's another one called the electron transport chain. Typically taught, you know, even in high school biology. I'll just mention it here. Uh, electron transport chain. These processes require um, Oxygen. Oxygen is the last electron acceptor. Well, that, that's why it's aerobic. So you need to know that mitochondria is aerobic metabolism and glycolysis is anaerobic. So aerobic metabolism. Okay, that's these two. And anaerobic. Glycolysis. So both of these produce ATP. In fact, the aerobic metabolism produces the most ATP <coughs> per molecule of glucose. Well, so in a kinesiology course, you go through the details of that, but we won't do it here. But the production of ATP. Again, most of it occurs aerobically, and if you look in the inner matrix, the cristae, there's a better picture of it here. The enzymes help facilitate it. Let me get my pointer. And um, Inside produces most of it. It's something like two molecules of ATP for this one, and then like 32 for the other one. Don't you don't need to know the numbers though. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. So the cristae are these um, inner membranes there. The mitochondria produce the uh, the ATP. I want to give you one example of a cell that well, is going to have a lot of mitochondria. This is a stomach cell. Um, it's the acid secreting cells, the parietal cells, and you'll learn that, but all these are mitochondria. And the cell has a very funny shape, like this kind of pitchfork shape, okay? This cell pumps protons into the lumen of the stomach, making it very acidic to help digestion. And so to pump hydrogen ions against its gradient, you need a lot of mitochondria to do it. Whenever you look at cells, the cell shape is rather large. It has an extensive cytoplasm, probably because it does a lot of work and it's going to contain a lot of mitochondria. One of the things that cells do is to make proteins. And proteins are going to require a lot of mitochondria to execute on those processes. And um, so the, the concept I want to teach you here, and this is one of the main things that cells do, they're like these tiny factories that, that produce proteins.
think of cells as tiny, expandable. Expandable because they can divide uh, protein making factories. So when we say protein synthesis, you're, you're, you're making it. You're linking together the amino acids and making proteins. And um, proteins are not the only major structural components of cells, but in the forms of enzymes, they're going to mediate every, every process in the cell. So understanding the steps of how proteins are made, uh, i.e. protein synthesis, is important. So now I want to talk about the organelles important, important for making protein synthesis. But to give you an overview of the process, Okay, just to make sure we're all on the same page here. Um, you may have seen this if you've taken any kind of college biology. You have to, you have to code for the protein. The nucleus contains the genetic code in the DNA molecules, okay? First keyword there is code. The nucleus contains the code. Then you have to synthesize the polypeptide chain. So we're going to learn about the three different kinds of um, RNA, which is kind of like DNA. Well, three types I want you to know. Um, okay, I'll just write them down here. The R RNA. Um, RNA. That, that's really going to help um, synthesize the protein or polypeptide chain. <clears throat> so the key here to listen to the steps, you have instructions on how to make the proteins. That's here in the DNA. You go from DNA to RNA, and you transfer that code, and all these three will combine to make it. Okay, so I'll list this like that's the second step. And then you produce the polypeptide chain. This is the protein. And this chain must be processed by the cell in a way where it can fold and package and be delivered to stay inside the cell to do work or to be exported. And that's the, the Golgi, um, the ER Golgi apparatus. It's called the endomembrane system. So I'll list that as like the fourth step. The endomembrane system, two things, ER Golgi. ER for sure, I'll write it out later, it's endoplasmic reticulum. That's what it says on the slide, the Golgi apparatus. The function of which basically process, quote unquote, this polypeptide chain. So I kind of outlined it for you there. Here's a picture of it, okay? It shows a big picture of the purple nucleus with a genetic code in it. The thing about DNA is it never leaves the nucleus. The thing about it is the polypeptide chain, which is your product, it's produced in the cytoplasm. So cells, um, you know, you need a way to get the instructions out of the protection of the nuclear envelope out here. and so. This is go between the mRNA, okay, and it's going to combine with the other RNAs um, to synthesize the polypeptide chain. It doesn't show the endomembrane system here. But let, let's go through the details of this process by looking at each of these um, steps, starting with number one, the nucleus. And you have a nice picture of it there. You have an illustration. Then you have a real scanning electron uh, microscopy photo. And they fracture it there so they can see the pores and you can see the nuclear lamina. 
I think um, this picture is easier to learn from. They show you the nucleus. This blue structure associated with the, the nucleus is the ER. We'll, we'll get to that. I'm just talking about the nucleus for now. Yeah, there's the... cells um, have a nucleus. There are very few cells that don't have one. Maybe your red blood cells are the only prime example of cells that actually don't have a nucleus. Okay? They kind of spit it out during uh, their development in bone marrow. But anyways, nucleus. I won't go into too much detail what I want you to know about it. It, it has a nuclear envelope um, that, to contain the DNA. So the nuclear envelope as pores. So things can e enter and exit. Right? For example, the mRNA has to exit because that message has to be carried by the messenger RNA from the nucleus to the cytoplasm. So I'll put that as a detail. mRNA can exit the nucleus. For example, uh, transcription factors can enter the nucleus. Transcription is the thing that basically turns genes on, so you can start to read the instruction. So, um, transcript. There's transcription factors. Uh, <clears throat> there's nuclear receptors. So things need to get in and out because you need to turn genes on. So things like these are, are, are molecules that can, um, I'm trying to communicate generally speaking, turn genes on. So it's not completely isolated from the cytoplasm around it is the point there. And, well, anyways, we learned about mitosis and the different stages of cell division where you can see the chromosome. The chromosomes are in there, right? The chromosomes. That's where the DNA is. DNA wound tightly around histone proteins. So chromosomes are DNA wound around histone proteins. Here's a replicated chromosome there. And they show you a little, little bit of a segment, so as you uncoil it, you can start to see the detail. Uh, I guess the purple strands are the double DNA helix wrapped around little histone proteins. Histones are a, a nice organizational thing. It's like, you know, when I put my Christmas lights away, instead of like a big jumble of cord I just throw in the box, I have a little spool that I wrap it around. You know, that's what the histone proteins are like. It's a convenient system to, to wrap the the helical structure of DNA around. All right, so the DNA is in the nuke. Let's talk about that endomembrane system since it's so closely associated with the nucleus. Here's the nuclear envelope, and here's um, the endoplasmic reticula. Now, they, put, they say cisterns. Cisterns are like these containers. And when polypeptides enter them, they'll fold and process in a way so they're more functional, and they can be um, exocytosed after that. All right, so let's put that as the next structure to learn. Endoplasmic reticulum. The endoplasmic reticulum can either be rough or smooth. Okay, let, let me put this detail first. What happens is this is where proteins go to just fold and take shape. Poly 
peptide chain enters the ER, folds, takes shape. I'll just be very general about it. I mean, when we studied the different levels of structure of proteins, there's the primary, secondary, tertiary, quaternary. I mean, so all that folding has to take shape from a very raw polypeptide chain form. So um, the ER, as it's called, can be rough or smooth. Rough ER. Sometimes that's abbreviated RER. The rough ER, um, basically, the rough is it's studded with ribosomes. Is ER studded with ribosomes? Now the ribosomes um, are actually the rRNA that I mentioned earlier. The little r is for ribosomes, and you know, this is where you manufacture the polypeptide chain. So it's very convenient to like be in a location where you're making the polypeptide chain, and then you have a short distance to travel to enter uh, the ER. Uh, but you could be smooth. You, smooth just means there's no ribosomes. Smooth ER. No ribosomes. Now the ER will then hand off uh, the processed protein for packaging, and that is the Golgi. And that, that's what's shown here, another, another cistern-like structure. It looks like a stack of pancakes. So what they're showing you there um, is the ER isolated. I'm sorry, is, is the Golgi isolated, that green structure? Let me, let me restart my hand at the top again. Let's say you have the nuclear envelope here, and then it shows ER associated with the nuke. And let's say it's rough ER right around here, because you have ribosomes right there. And they're producing polypeptide chains, a little green line. That's your protein, PRO, polypeptide chain. And this must be processed by the ER, the endoplasmic reticulum. And so that um, polypeptide chain will enter, and it'll just kind of, as it, as it moves along, maybe it'll fold, maybe it'll take shape as it just kind of moves along there. Let's say it kind of like gets folded into this kind of globular structure. And that globular structure is then exocytosed. processed further by the Golgi. And the side that faces the Golgi, this cis face um, right here, it's Golgi, appar Golgi apparatus, let's see here. The side that faces the uh, ER is the, the cis face. Let me draw it differently here. Stack of pancakes. Is my Golgi. Cis face, same side as ER. The other face they call trans.
and this vesicle will pass on uh, the protein for further packaging. So I'll just kind of draw this weird shape I drew in there. And it's passed on through this cistern, looks like a stack of pancakes, until it's finally exocytosed by the Golgi to either be used by the cell or exocytosed by the cell itself. So I'll draw another vesicle coming off Golgi containing your finished product. So maybe it looks a little different. You're done making the protein at that point. And what can happen is um, sometimes this process, this process concludes by fusing um, what you made with a lysosome. Lysosomes are these little um, packages of digestive proteins in the cell. And a good figure of their function, they're not much to look at, but there's these little like blobs inside the cell. The light green areas are regions where you have materials being digested. Sometimes you're, you're producing things that need to be digested. So the lysosome function is shown here. I'll erase this now. Now the lysosome function, it can do a few things. Number one, here's a lysosome. Sometimes what the Golgi apparatus makes are lysosomes. It contains digestive enzymes. And this vesicle, if it needs to kind of um, digest a damaged organelle, it can, it can be fused with that. That's one function of lysosomes. Fuse, then digest old, damaged organelles. The other thing, if you endocytose something that's garbage that you need to get rid of, you, you could kind of fuse it with this endocytose structure there for uh, digestion. <coughs> Number two. Fuse, digest, um, endocytose, pathogens. You know, anything that's you know non-cell, that's what they show you there. And once you digest it, you just kind of spit it out, eject the residue. The third thing is you can just commit autolysis. Some cells, um, they under, undergo what's called um, apoptosis or programmed cell death. This, this can help that process. Okay, you're meant to die and be replaced by new cells that are regenerating somewhere else. So autolysis assists. That, that's just where lysis means burst. So the lysosome simply bursts. All those um, digestive enzymes will destroy the cell ultimately, called it apoptosis. I believe uh, apoptosis, pronounced apoptosis, second P is silent, which is programmed cell death. Now, so know the functions of uh, the lysosome. The other structures um, that make up the cytoplasm are the cytoskeleton, and there's a, there's a combination of uh, filaments that we usually talk about inside a skeleton. Micro, intermediate, and then microtubules. These are all kind of filament type structures. Microfilaments. Intermediate filaments, 
now this microtubules over here. I want to give you some examples of the third one, microtubules, that you see a lot in tissues and cells. Cilium, centrioles, and they also work with um, motor molecules in the cell. So the first two are um, structures I may have mentioned already. This is a picture of a cilia. You can see this beautiful arrangement of the cilia. You don't have to know these, um, but just know that a cilia is an appendage or an attachment to a top of a cell. So no cilia. Microtubules make cilia. Let me, let me erase the top of the board here. Cilia. So think of um, a cell. With all the cytoplasm, let's say it has a nucleus inside there. Cilia are like at the top. attached to one side of the cell membrane at the top. They really stuck it in the cell membrane there. You can kind of see how the basal body is kind of associated with the plasma membrane there. Their job is to beat in one direction. They, beat, they whip in a way where they, they have organized beating. They can, they can move objects along, along the surface. So if there's objects or debris or whatever it is, you can kind of move them in one direction with the, with the beating of the cilia. The other thing we talked about is the centrosome matrix. And so um, I drew it in, in class before as like this. The sensor cell ma matrix are two centrioles. This is review. That one there, that one there. And then radiating out of the matrix are individual microtubules or astral rays. And so go back and look at your uh, mitosis notes. I already taught this. Those are individual microtubules called astral rays. Those help in the cell division process. Here's a picture of the organized beating of the cilia. And if there's a layer of mucus, things get caught in that mucus layer and can be moved along uh, the cell surface. You can even, I'm sure you can Google beautiful pictures of this cilia function. One good example of this is in your throat, in the trachea, your windpipe. There's a big mucus layer, and it's called the mucus escalator because it only beats one direction. So every time you cough things out, the cough is productive because you're able to cough it out. So the trachea has a mucus escalator function. Here's a picture of the cilia. I think it's really nice to look at. Uh, what the cilia does, you can see in the picture there, um, oh, I'm sorry, that's not cilia, this is microvilli. She looks like silly. I fooled myself. Okay, this is the next thing. I'm moving away from talk, talking about uh, these filaments. Microvilli. Wait. I'll erase the bottom. Remember, you can always go back and look at the YouTube. In fact, what I want to do, I want to do more. I want to put the clock over here so it's in camera. So anything you miss, you can just write the time down and then go to the YouTube video and get to the time quickly. 
figure it out later. I gotta get a screwdriver. Um, okay, Michael Bila. It's a folding of the plasma membrane and it increases the absorptive surface area. So let me write that down. So compare a regular cube-shaped cell versus, say, a cell that has a folded side like that one. So the microvilli are a folding of the plasma membrane, like right here. You just have more surface area because being all folded like that, if you were to measure the length, it, you'd have more area than this simple flat surface there. So if the job is um, to absorb or secrete, you have more area to do that. So that, that's the purpose of the microvilli. Okay, uh, I'm going to move on. I'll we'll get into DNA. This will start to get us ready for Friday's lab too. So I already talked about nucleus and DNA, but I really, really want to un unpackage DNA. And I have a picture there. It's a black and white picture, so you know it's old. Who are those two guys? I wonder if people still know who they are. Watson and Crick. Yeah, most of you do know that. Watson and Crick. So take a guess. Who, who's the younger guy? Watson or Crick? Watson. And actually, he had a 50-50 shot, right? He's actually, I don't want to say he's the brilliant one, but he, he's actually the guy. Okay, if there ever is a guy between those two. He's a Nobel Prize winner. They both won a Nobel Prize. Um, it was 22 when he did this. He elucidated the structure of uh, DNA. And there, there's their model there. I think they're, they're in a race, and I'm sure maybe you've watched that in high school biology class. And, they're competing with uh, Linus Pauling. Anyways, what I did when I was a grad student, I got so frustrated with just reading, reading it in textbooks, but I had actually never read their original letter, their original paper that they published. And, um, well, to give you a little background, we're talking about like 19, the early 1950s. So the, the concept I'm trying to teach you here is that DNA is the pri primary genetic material. We, we kind of already know that. It's kind of in DNA is in popular culture. It's a subject of TV shows. Um, but, but imagine it's like 1950 or before, and you don't know which molecules carry the genes. As recently as 1950, the molecular structure of the gene was unknown. So it was impossible to explain the gene-protein relationship. Okay, It's kind of hard to be a geneticist if you don't know what to study. All right. Uh, of course, they knew about carbs, proteins, lipids, nucleic acids, and if you had to guess, back in the 1950s, scientists thought proteins carried the genes because they were so diverse a class of molecules. It has to be something like proteins. Of course, we know it's the DNA, the nucleic acids. And um, well, anyways, I remember when I went to the library. I was, I was a grad student in the 90s. We really didn't have the internet back then, and what well, we did, but not like today. And I remember like finding the journal, okay, and I had to go to the stacks and pull the book out, and like, and I got there, like someone ripped it out, and I was like, what? The? So I had to go and find it in another journal. These days, you can just Google it, and it's online. This, this is I just cut and pasted this. Now the remarkable thing about this paper, I mean, it changed the trajectory of um, science and medicine and technology. This is it. It's one page. And it spills over, there's like a paragraph on the next page. And I was like, whoa, this is really short. Um, but it speaks to their ability to write well. I mean, they could have gone on like for 50 pages and people would have read it, right? But they just kept it really short, really simple, and even undergraduates can understand it. 
they use language that's very easy to understand. I think Watson, uh, he's written other books. I think he's one, he's a premier writer as he was a scientist, okay? He's the one all my professors used to talk about. And um, well, what I did was for my lecture to you guys, I, I just took their language instead of the textbook language and I just put it in my PowerPoint slides. And here, here are the things that they say about DNA, about its structure anyways. It has a regular shape. It's a double helix, right? It's right-handed. That means that, that turns how it turns around its axis. The double helix is held together by hydrogen bonds between base pairs. And so, I mean, even if you've never studied DNA before, I mean, we, we can all take um, take a picture of this and understand it, right? It's a coiled double polymer of nucleotides with an alternating sugar phosphate. Backbone. It's like a twisted ladder, okay? And what we're going to do Friday is we have like these DNA kits. Like, um, there's a thin metal rod, and you, you can construct this double helix around it, and you guys will get a chance to build a DNA model on Friday. Um, okay, we'll skip the slide there. So I wanted to show you um, basically the monomers of DNA, these, these nucleotides and what they contain. That's the basic building structure of deoxy... Uh, ribonucleic acid, or just DNA. The building block of DNA, understand the nucleotide structure. It's got a sugar phosphate backbone, so one phosphate group. The sugar, which is um, deoxyribose, as opposed to ribose in RNA, so. It's a sugar. And the thing we'll talk about mostly are this, these nit nitrogen-containing bases. I'll just put base. Bases. They, they are either of the purine or pyrimidine kind, or you can kind of see here, uh, the bases are complementary, they base pair, and they're held together by hydrogen bonds. There are complementary base pairs held together by hydrogen bonds. Yeah, it's easy for DNA to replicate because you could break that apart. Yeah, easy to replicate, and uh, when you can like expose it, it's easy to transcribe the gene too. Yeah. Okay, you're right. The hydrogen bonds are like I said. I think I said they're the weakest. Um, well, anyways, look at their picture. It's really not fancy at all, right? They just show you how it turns around the axis, like rungs of a ladder. So here, here's a quote from their paper. Um, the double helix held together by double bonds between base pairs. The novel feature of the structure is the manner in which the two chains are held together by the purine and pyrimidine bases. Purine, pyrimidine. Well, here they are. The purines are the adenine and the guanine. I just usually abbreviate them A and G. Those, those are the purines. In the um, pyrimidines, C T U. We are going to talk about RNA. Uh, thymine is for um, is found in the DNA, but the uracil is for RNA only. That's something worth noting. So it's the thymine, that's the DNA, uracil, RNA.
All right, so the next concept, these base pairs, they, they pair up. They're complementary to each other. Specific base pairing via hydrogen bonds, these are forming the rungs of the ladder. Um, if adenine forms one member of a pair on either chain, then the other member must be thymine, similarly for guanine and cytosine. So it's telling you what matches with what. A with T, C with G. So, if only, speci if only specific pairs of bases can be formed, it follows that if the sequence of bases on one chain is given, then the sequence on the other chain is automatically determined. So I just put up some random letters there. One sequence of the chain of DNA is TCGCAT. That's one chain of bases. Well, you could deduce what the other one is, right? You just match it up. C A. What goes with C? Oh, G. Uh, C uh, G T A. Okay. I mean, really, it's just atoms fitting atoms. But um, I mean, it's the simple matching. It's not a hard concept to get. Right? It's a simple molecule. So let's remember, we are going to talk about DNA to DNA, which is a double chain, but we are going to talk about RNA. And RNA, um, when you transcribe a gene, has the base pair with the DNA, too. So, so that's why here, base pairing and DNA replication, it's always A with T, T with A, or C with G, C with G here. Now, uh, in RNA, again, um, you don't have thymine, you have uracil. Okay, that's the only difference you have to remember. So uracil matches with uh, A, okay? RNA does not have thymine. Uh, one of the things I want to talk about is how DNA replicates, because this I mentioned this for mitosis. In the S phase, all the DNA has to replicate, it has to double before you can divide the cell one into two. And so here's a picture of uh, DNA being unwound. You're exposing the two, the two chains to base pair with more DNA, okay? Because you're making one DNA into two in DNA replication. So let's talk about that. What I say there at the top is worth noting, it's, it's semi-conservative. Now one DNA molecule is becoming two, right? For example, here's the old DNA being replicated. Notice how you're unwinding it, but your base pairing with the chain that's from the old DNA here, as well as here. So in each of these two new DNAs, half of it is from the old chain. You're conserving half of the old chain in each of the two new chains. So but you get it, that's where semi-conservative comes from, conserving half the old chain. And I won't go too much into details here. I think we should know a couple of enzymes that help this process, although there are many more than I'm presenting. You have to unwind the chain as helicase, because that will expose 
um, the base the bases of the chain so you can pair with it. Let's write down helicase. Unwinds DNA. Well, then you have to like synthesize half of a new chain. So that's DNA polymerizing. They can only work in one direction. And there's this five prime, three prime thing. I really don't teach that, but because these um, the DNA strands, they're 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 what's called anti-parallel. I mean, they're not parallel. They're they're anti-parallel. So the DNA uh, polymerase, they have to work in opposite directions because they only can work in one direction. And it happens it's going to be the opposite directions. So the DNA polymerase will make the two new DNAs. DNA polymerase. I'll just say simply, they'll synthesize the two new DNAs. Two new DNA molecules. Notice one, the leading strand is running in the same direction as the helicase unwinds. So um, the leading strand is a continuous uh, synthesis there. So the DNA polymer per polymerase of the leading strand Synthesizes, I misspelled synthesize there, sorry. Synthesize. Synthesize. A new DNA continuously. Lying strand synthesizes a new DNA in fragments. It's non-continuous. The DNA polymerase of lagging strand Synthesizes a new DNA in fragments. I think they're called Uzaki fragments. You don't have to know that. Just fragments. So if here's your DNA, and you're just trying to copy that blue line. The helicase, say there's this green circle, it's going one direction. But notice the polymerase has to run in the opposite direction. So it's like, okay, well, um, so let's say this red line represents the other half of the new DNA that you're making. but. You, you kind of have to go, the red line is going this way, but you keep unwinding it the other way. So as you keep unwinding it, let's see if I can do this. I don't know if I can. I need an animation here. You're going this way, right? And there's this gap. Okay? So then the DNA, the new DNA polymerase, it has to like make it this way. You're going that way, and then, oh, okay, and then, oh, I have to keep jumping backwards. I have to go like that. Oh, I have to keep jumping backwards and go like that. And each time you, you, you make a new fragment, you have to ligase them together anyways. Hold on. I just hope you understand that the lagging strand is synthesized. It's not continuous. It synthesizes it in fragments. And that's all I wanted to say about DNA replication. Okay. 
think this is a good spot for a break. And we can pick this up on Friday. One thing I want to mention before I let you go for your break, just so you have a heads up. I think we've got enough material. Quiz Friday. It's not on the schedule, so I'm giving you a heads up. Uh, I would study everything from the first two chapters. First two. Chapter one, two. You should be into those by now. And I would just focus on your lecture notes. I will administer the quiz at the end of class, okay? The lab shouldn't take very long. So I think there'll be plenty of time at, at the end of the lab time, maybe the last 20, 30 minutes of class to take the quiz. All right, so that's Friday. All right, let's take a break, come back at around 15, around 8.45. 8.45 and I'll introduce the lab.